we have this curve C, it has an equation y is equal to kx to the power of 3. The tangent at point P on the curve C meets the curve again at point Q. And the tangent at point Q meets the curve again at point R. The x coordinate of P, Q, R are P, Q, R respectively. A lot of information is being given because I have read it a few times. So it is pretty okay for me. So I will be expecting you guys who are probably reading it for the very first time to take a while to let this whole thing, to let all this information sink in. From just this first paragraph, there are two things that I did take note of. Number one is they didn't actually tell me whether k is positive or negative. k definitely is not going to be equal to zero. Okay, the question didn't mention, but I know it, could, it cannot be equal to zero. If k is equal to zero, y is going to be equal to zero. It's just going to be one horizontal line. Another thing that I'm taking note of is that p cannot be equal to zero. Why is it that p cannot be equal to zero? I think it will be an advantage. And I do want you to think about this also when you're doing the question yourself, which is that this particular curve is actually a standard curve. One that you have memorized in your secondary school, y is equal to x to the power of 3. So k will tend to scale it by a factor of k times parallel to the y-axis. And depending on whether k is positive or negative, it may cause it to be reflected about the y-axis. So assuming that k is bigger than 0, assuming this, so that I can have a better idea of how what this question is, uh, <coughs> is talking about. So I'm going to assume k to be positive for me to do a sketch of the scenario. Let's see what problem we may be facing when we are trying to do this sketch. So I, am, I know that this is a graph that is something that is like this. y is equal to x cubed looks like this. So if k is positive, it is just going to be a scaling by a factor of k, uh, by, by a factor of k parallel to the y-axis. So the shape remains the same kx to the power of 3, x-axis, y-axis. I want to draw this fast, or else maybe I'll just take the calculator and quickly just get an idea of what this is. But I do know that this, at the origin, this is a stationary point of inflection. Why? Not because I look at my calculator. My advantage lies in the fact that I have already seen this as a standard graph. So please, I mean, I do urge you guys to try to memorize all those graphs that you have learned in your secondary school. Don't just depend on your GC, okay? All these are going to get a small little advantage to how you're going to be reacting to seeing graphs in your exam. Because they are still going to be standard graphs. Like what I was telling you, the moment when it is a standard graph, your advantage lies in what you have already memorized about the standard graph. So if you don't memorize them, that means when that graph appears in your exam, you have no advantage compared to the rest of the cohort because I can guarantee, okay, most of the people, they don't memorize enough standard graphs. So at the moment when you memorize, you're already moving up the bell curve. So this is a stationary point of inflection. And now I can understand why P cannot be equal to zero. Because if P is equal to zero, P is the X coordinate of the point P, which means that if P is equal to zero, we are talking about a tangent that is here. And because this is a stationary point of inflection, the tangent is going to be y is equal to 0. So it will not cut the graph again at any other point other than the origin. So the entire question P, Q, R are all going to be equal to 0. So it will not work you know, for whatever that the question is trying to set up for. Okay, so P cannot be equal to 0. P can be positive. P can be negative. I'm going to just assume, let's say P is here. So if point P is here, the x co point P is here, the x coordinate of P is lowercase p. The tangent is going to be cutting the graph again. Okay, it's going to cut the graph again at this point here. So this point here is point Q and the x coordinate of point Q is going to be Q. I have this. And according to the question, the same thing repeats. The tangent at point Q is going to meet the curve again at point R. So the tangent at point Q the tangent at point Q is going to meet the curve again at point R. Okay, I am, I'm seeing a bit of a problem, not huge problem, because this is just a sketch. But I know that it's going to be cutting at a point that is very, very high. So, so I'm literally trying to showcase to you like small little glitches that can happen during the exam, because you cannot, you cannot foresee all this happening. So it's okay, you know, I just know that this curve is going to extend, it's going to cut somewhere at R. So from somewhere, we are going to have one point that comes down. 
that point that come down all the way, I don't know where it is, okay, that point that comes down all the way is going to be, it's going to be uh, this R, so it is going to be meeting at that point, that point is R. So the tangent at P meets at Q, the tangent at Q meets the curve again at point R. Part one, we want to show that P and Q satisfy this equation. We want to show that P and Q satisfy this equation. It is a four marks question, and I think this four marks is very difficult to get. Not, it is not whether you have studied your H2 math or not. It is whether you have already, like what I've been saying in the last few weeks, whether you have already been accustomed to coming up with your own set of instruction instead of the question telling you what to do. Because the question here, five part one, is very obvious. I mean, it is very obvious to me that they have purposely removed most of the instruction. Show that P and Q satisfy this equation. So we probably need to do a bit of trial and error. I'm going to try a few things, okay? As like I'm going to, this is how I'm going to be trying it. Because the question talk about the tangent at the point P. By the way, um, I'm trying to show you my entire thought process by doing the question together with you. But uh, in case you have some ideas and processes that you feel that you want to talk about, right? It just, just type into the chat, okay? I, I, I do want to hear your opinion. Okay? So, uh, the question says, since the question talk about the tangent at the point P, I think the first rational thing that we probably should be doing is to find the equation of the tangent. Right? Equation of the tangent. I don't know whether it is going to... I, I don't know how it is going to help. But looking at the situation, most likely I will need the equation of the tangent. So I'm going to initiate this. I'm forming my own set of instruction. Please empathize the, the entire scenario together with me, okay? It is not easy to do this question because the question actually didn't ask you to find the equation of the tangent. But we do know that the tangent is going to make this point at Q. So P and Q is related this way. So I'm going to take this. I'm going to find dy dx. dy dx is 3kx square. So I'm going to try to find the equation of the tangent at the point P. So at the point P. At the point P, I know the x coordinate is equal to the lowercase p. I know the y coordinate is going to be k p to the power of 3. And I know that dy dx is going to be 3 k p square. So with these three pieces of information, we will be able to find the equation of the tangent at the point P, the tangent at the point P will be y minus the y coordinate is equal to the gradient of 3kp square of x minus the x coordinate. I personally, I, I am not someone who always need to change the equation of a line into y is equal to mx plus c form. I don't need to, but I know some people, they just have this, um, have this, like, they, they just one, okay, every line must become y is equal to mx plus c. I don't think that is, uh, that is good as an HGMF student. It, it really depends. So here, I don't think I want to waste time, especially when it is a bit more complicated like this, right? I don't think I want to waste time to make this into y is equal to mx plus c. So I'm going to leave this as it is like this. Because I want to spend, I, I, I don't even know what I'm going to be doing next, you know? So making this into y equal mx plus c, okay, maybe it's going to help, maybe it's not. I'm going to just see what I'm going to do. I'm going to just think what I'm going to do next first. So now I have this, and uh, I will still need this to interact with the point Q because I need to bring point Q into my entire solution. So how do I bring Q into my entire solution? According to what the question says, this tangent is going to be intersecting the curve again at point Q. So when two curves intersect, I know what is the theory that is behind. Algebraic theory, what is it? It is simultaneous equation. They are happening here simultaneously, the tangent and the original curve. So I guess what I'm going to do is, I'm going to call this my equation number two. And uh, the original equation, I'm going to quote it here, y is equal to kx to the power of three. I'm going to call this equation number one. So I'm going to try to look at point Q by solving for equation number one to be substituted into equation number two. And that will give me a y substitute into here. That will give me a kx to the power of 3 minus kp to the power of 3 is equal to kp square x minus 
P and and I, I did strategize for this. Let, let me just tell you what is what was my strategy, okay? I didn't anyhow solve this simultaneous equation. I'm solving this simultaneous equation by letting this y over here be kx to the power of 3. Because when you solve simultaneous equation, actually you can solve for x or you can solve for y. You, you usually solve for either one of them first, correct? But you think about it. Is it more logical to try to solve for x or is it more logical to try to solve for y? Which one is more logical? It is more logical to try to solve for x, isn't it? x instead of y, although I can. Okay, I just make x the subject, then I try to substitute into here. Then I can, re then I can have an equation that is in terms of y instead of in terms of x. But why is it more rational for us to solve for x, uh, to have an equation in terms of x instead of an equation in terms of y? Because p, q, and r, all these are the x coordinate of the points that are on the graph. All these are the x coordinate of the points. So my plan is this. After I've substituted into after I've substituted this into here, that means this is going to give me two solutions. I will be expecting this to be giving me two solutions. Can, can you think about what are the two possible solutions to this equation without even having to solve this equation? Can you think about the two possible roots of this equation? Um, Timothy, what do you think is the roots of this equation? Based on the scenario that we have looked at so far, what do you think is the roots of this equation? Uh, the x coordinates of the intersection point. Okay, not just that. There are two roots, right? Can you see, Timothy? There are two roots. Yeah. Me, the two roots will be x is equal to p, or the other one will be x is equal to q. Because this line and the original gra graph is going to be intersecting at two points. One is at P, one is at Q. Which means that, um, I mean, since these are roots, that means they will satisfy the equation. Which means that I can either sub P into here or sub Q into here. I will definitely sub Q into here, right? Because I am trying, according to what the question says, I'm trying to find a logical way to form an equation in terms of P and Q and that equation should not have x, should not have y, should not have k. k is fine because after I've done this, I can really see all the k are going to disappear. So now my problem is that in this equation, there's still x, which is according to my strategy because I can replace x by either p or q. If this equation is going to be one that turns out that he has y instead of x, I, I, there's no way for me to remove the y. So like what Timothy says, q is going to satisfy this equation. And because Q is going to satisfy this equation, I know that at the point Q, X is going to be equal to Q. So it satisfies this equation Q to the power of 3 minus P to the power of 3. This is going to be equal to 3P squared. Then we, here we have a Q minus P. Any questions that any of you have so far? So now I have an equation in terms of P and Q. And what this question one is not just any equation in terms of P and Q, they want it to be specifically this way. I have to be very honest with you, okay? When I was doing this question, I missed out this. Use the identity, blah, blah, blah. You know, so I've missed out this. This is my fault. We should try to see all the information that is given to us by the question. So I went to factorize it myself. How stupid that is, you know? So, so I should use the information that is given. And I think I can apply it here. So if I were to apply it here, then it is going to be Q minus P. Multiply by, if I were to apply it, it will be Q square plus QP plus P square. And this is equal to 3P square Q minus P. I, I know to be to apply this equation, this identity, I do need a certain skill. The skill is, if they were to give you a result, you are supposed to be able to use that result to apply it to somewhere else. So where, where do we pick up such skills? When they give you a result, you will apply the result to somewhere else. We have been discussing about it and two very prominent topics where this skill is going to be allocated quite a lot, quite a lot of marks. 
will be in summation, will be in maclaurins, right? That was what we have discussed. Because in summation, one big part of summation question will be how you are going to be using a result that is given to you or a result that you have derived in part one to deal with another summation. So we are learning how to do that uh, for a more for a slightly more challenging kind of result. So we so we tend to do that more often in question for summation. For maclaurins, it's the same. It's not every single time you got to differentiate, you know, to find the maclaurins. Sometimes you use an existing maclaurins to deduce another maclaurin. So now we are seeing a small little algebraic result that was given to me, so I customize. And uh, very likely in your school's exam and Cambridge exam, you're going to see this happening also. They will give you a certain result. The result may not be as simple as this. It may come with a theory and they may give you some names about that particular result which you have never heard before. Your aim is to just understand it on the spot. Usually it's not going to be very difficult. You just need to feel comfortable about it then just apply. So expect this, okay? So now I have this and I guess P minus Q and P minus Q can be cancelled. And I will have this. So now I have a Q square plus Q P plus uh, this. I'm going to bring it over. So P square minus two P minus three P square. This gives me minus two. So I have a minus two P square. This is equal to zero. And I'm going to divide this throughout by P square to get what the question want me to prove. And it's good because P cannot be equal to zero. This allows me to divide it throughout by P. So divided by p squared, this gets me a p, q over p squared plus this is going to be q over p, then minus away 2. This is equal to 0. So, okay, I've proven the first part. Again, I need you to do this yourself. You know why? Because it's very different. I mean, even, even if you can remember how I did it, okay, when you're doing yourself, um, the feeling is different. I mean, you just think about it again. How little instruction has been given to you in order for you to do part one of this question? They are not telling you a lot of things. Okay, which is what I'm trying to tell you. Um, you know, on top, on top of you know, whatever that you have been working on, the instructional components in certain parts of the question will be removed. And your aim is to be able to adapt and try to use all the things that you have learned to, accom to, to come up with that, that, that strategy you need to navigate yourself through this thing. So now I have done this. It is four marks. Pretty worth it, okay? Four marks is almost like five marks. Five marks is going to be one great jump. Show that P, Q, R, next part two. Show that P, Q, R are consecutive terms of a geometric progression. Hence, determine if this geometric progression is convergent. This convergent thing is something that I'm really expecting how I will be doing it. Because uh, I'm going to try to find the common ratio. And if the common ratio is between minus 1 and 1, then it is convergent. If it is not, it is not convergent. So I'm going to try to solve for the common ratio. And in order for me to show that P, Q, R are three consecutive terms of the geometric progression, that means they must, uh, <clears throat> when one divided by another, it should be equal to another one divided by the other one, correct? So, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm already seeing a form of it here, Q divided by P. That means if I were to look at it, the three consecutive terms as P comma Q comma R. If they were to be GP, that means Q divided by P must be equal to R divided by Q. So let's try to solve for not P, not Q, but let's try to solve for P over Q. Let's try to solve for P over Q. And to solve for P over Q, of course, we can uh, see it as if it is R squared plus r minus 2 is equal to 0. You know, I'm, I'm just letting r be equal to q over p. Uh, I mean, this is something that I thought it was very silly that I did. I, I just want to show you, okay, because I was trying to do this question fast. So, and the symbol that I'm more familiar with is r to represent common ratio. So I let r be equal to this. Then, I mean, I found r, but then I realized I was very silly because the question has already used r. So having a lot of R that is like this is not very useful in exams because it, it, it's going to get very, very messy. Teachers probably will mark wrong, but I don't think they will minus marks because they know that your R means something else. 
But I know I want to try to avoid this. This is a bad habit. When will this bad habit really kill me? For example, let me give you two scenarios where you anyhow use a symbol that is familiar to you but not customized for the question to do question, okay? The first scenario is discriminant. B squared minus 4AC. We always B squared minus 4AC, B squared minus 4AC. Then in some, sometimes in secondary school, we even say A is equal to this, B is equal to this, C is equal to this, then use B squared minus 4AC. Personally, I've already stopped using B squared minus 4AC. I recite B squared minus 4AC in my head. But usually when I want to address the discriminant, I'll either use the capitalized D or I will spell out the, the word D. Because, right, in our H2 math, especially uh, like graphing techniques, there will be a lot of ABC unknowns. And they may not be the exact same ABC that is in, uh, in the in the B squared minus 4AC. So if you use B squared minus 4AC, you write B squared minus 4AC is equal to, because you are talking about discriminant, B squared minus 4AC is equal to, and there are other B, other A, other C that represent something else. So the whole solution becomes very confusing. And I literally will see students losing uh, very, very unnecessary marks because they got confused by their own like notation. This is one. Another one that can be also very confusing is uh, for example, us using the same A for the AP and GP, the first term of the AP and GP. So A, A, but then the question didn't, in that same question, there's an AP, there's a GP, but the question didn't say that the first, they share the same first term. So if you use A, A, then after a while, right, you'll see people start to think that these two are the same A. You will not feel this when you're doing paper yourself, but when you're rushing, you may start to get unaware of this, then you are going to lose marks. It's very painful, especially when it comes to the A-level, where you thought you have gotten the whole question correct. But then along the way, you accidentally use the same A. And sometimes even if you get the chance to check, you may be blinded to you know, that you are using the same A. So it's better okay, to just kick the habit as much as possible. So these are... <clears throat> cannot. I just want to make sure that I don't want to use my own symbol. I just want to make sure that I customize for the question. So I might as well don't even represent this as anything else, but just leaving it as Q over P as a term, then plus Q over P, then minus two, this is equal to zero. Factorizing this, I have a Q over P uh, plus two, then Q over P minus one. This is equal to zero. If you feel this is very uncomfortable for you, at least choose a uh, alphabet. You know, that is not used by the question. For example, letting Q over P be equal to X, then you're solving for X squared minus plus X minus two is equal to zero. So now I know from here that Q over P, this is equal to minus two, or Q over P, this is equal to one, which is not possible because Q over P cannot be equal to one because P and Q cannot be the same point. The only place on my graph where Q and P can be the same point is when P is at zero. Then P is equal to Q is equal to R, they are all going to be equal to zero. So this is not physically possible according to my graph. In fact, I don't even want this to happen because uh, even if Q over P can be equal to one, it cannot be used for me to say that there's a GP that is going on, right? Because R for a GP can never be equal to one or else every single term is going to be A, 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 A. So I know Q over P is equal to minus two and at the same time, I'm going to do deduction. The deduction is that after I've done it once, because, because of how generalized this entire question is, they didn't tell me what is K, they didn't tell me whether K is positive or negative, they didn't tell me whether P, Q, R, they are positive or negative, that allow me to deduce another version, which is a version that is between Q and R, a deduction. So I can deduce that R over Q square plus at a, um, at a point R. R over Q squared plus R over Q minus two will also be equal to zero because it is going through and an, an exactly the same process, which means that R over Q is going to be equal to minus two. So we can now say that since Q over P is equal to R over Q is equal to minus two. Therefore, we are looking at a GP. And since the common ratio is not between minus one and one, so this GP is not convergent. Okay, any question? And I want you to replicate.